Hello and welcome to the Fundamentals of Surge Protection webinar. I'm Mike Molinari and I'll be your presenter today. Here we have an outline of the information we'll be covering today. First, I'll give a little bit of background on DITEC Corporation, and then we'll take a look at surges and spikes. We'll review the causes and the effects. We'll look at some industry terminology, and then we'll go over some of the UL scopes that pertain to the surge protection industry. Following that, we'll go over how surge protection actually works, and we'll take a look at some of the different surge protection technologies that we use, including silicon avalanche diodes, metal oxide varistors, and gas discharge tubes. Next, we'll review how to properly apply surge protection to various low voltage and electrical systems. We'll also show some examples of typical design criteria that are used in the field. And then we'll take a look at surge protection installation rules, followed by proper grounding techniques. Here at Ditech, we continue Here to lead at the industry in the design, the design and manufacturing, and manufacturing of electrical, and low voltage, of electrical surge protection and low voltage surge protection Ditech was founded in 1988. was founded in 1988 and, and we're located in we sunny Largo, Florida. Florida. We manufacture 300 different we product more solutions, than 300 different product solutions, solutions for the commercial, unparalleled production options for the commercial, commercial industrial, and residential markets. Here's a picture of Team Ditech out in our factory. Ditec is a veteran-owned small business, and we are still proudly making our products right here in the USA. What are surges and spikes? The simplest definition that we can provide is that they are unexpected, temporary, and uncontrolled increases in current or voltage in an electrical circuit. Surges and spikes can be present on any metallic conductor. So when you think of a facility, and all of the different copper wires coming into that facility, those are vulnerable paths for surge to get in and cause damage. Surges and spikes can damage, degrade, and even destroy electrical and electronic equipment, and they are by far the most common cause of equipment damage and destruction. Now we'll review the causes of surges and spikes. And these causes can be categorized as external or internal. And first, we'll talk about lightning strikes, as they are the most dramatic. However, direct lightning strikes account for less than 20% of all surge damage. A much more common cause of transient voltages is a proximity strike. This is essentially a surge generated from a lightning strike up to several miles away from the facility. These transients can travel along transmission lines, or can even be induced onto any buried copper cabling. Then we have surges and spikes that are caused by the utility company. And by far the most common is capacitor bank switching. Now this would be the automatic switching of substation capacitors based on power factor and or voltage, which then generates transients. Then we have brownouts and blackouts, which are under voltages or voltage sags, immediately followed by a surge or a spike. Now for internal causes, inductive loads are by far the most common cause of transient voltages. And these are occurring within the facility itself. This would be due to the switching on and off of electric motors, such as HVAC systems, refrigeration equipment, pumps, CNC machines, and especially copiers and printers. Then we have mechanical failures, which would be components of the electrical distribution system failing, causing an overvoltage situation. And lastly, human error. Now, as much as we like to think this doesn't occur, it can happen, and this would be the accidental induction of AC power on low voltage system circuits. Here we have a map of the continental US that shows average flash density for lightning strikes. And this is measured in flashes per square mile per year. And we like to review this map to show that all states within the continental US do experience lightning strikes to some degree. Now, obviously, lightning is much more prevalent in the southeast versus the northwest, but it only takes one good lightning strike to damage equipment. Now we'll review the effects of surges and spikes, and we refer to them as the three Ds. So first we have degradation, which would be the gradual deterioration of internal circuitry, which would include premature equipment failure. Now this type of scenario is due to surges that happen more frequently, like inductive loads. 
Then you have destruction, which is the instantaneous loss of expensive equipment, including electronics, motors, controllers, etc. Destruction is typically due to either a direct or a proximity lightning strike. And then the most important of the 3Ds would be your downtime. This is going to include loss of productivity and revenue, and loss of critical data and information. So a perfect scenario would be a video surveillance camera that goes down due to a surge. In addition to the cost of the camera, you also have the cost of the image that you're not recording while the camera is down. So sometimes that cost you can't even put a number on because if an event happens, uh, an injury or a loss prevention type situation occurs and you don't have that video to go back to for evidence, that could ultimately prove to be priceless. Now the purpose of the following animation is to give you an idea of what the surge protector is actually doing on the circuit. So here's a representation of your normal AC-DC line voltage and along comes the initial surge or spike. Now the surge protector sees this surge, opens a path to ground, bleeds the excess energy out of the system, resets, and the surge has been clamped. Now one thing I want to note is that the surge protectors do not have any type of moving parts inside of them. They are solid state components. Now let's talk more about the specific types of surge protection technology. And first and foremost, we'll go over metal oxide varistors, known as MOVs. These are comprised typically of zinc oxide that conducts when it is exposed to an overvoltage that exceeds its rating. MOVs do have a finite life expectancy and degrade when exposed to a few large transients or many more smaller transients and will eventually short to ground creating an end of life scenario. This condition will cause a circuit breaker to trip or a fused link to open. Larger transients may cause the component to open, thus bringing about a more violent end to the component itself. MOVs are typically used to suppress transients found in AC power circuits. So MOVs have a relatively large surge current capacity, but they do degrade over time. Next we have silicon avalanche diodes, known as SADs. These are comprised of silicon or other semiconductor materials. And these components provide faster reaction times and better voltage clamping compared to other technologies, but they do have much lower current handling capabilities. Unlike MOVs, they do not degrade over time when used within their ratings. When component ratings are exceeded, the device will short, creating a ground fault. And these are typically used to suppress transients found in low voltage communication and data circuits. Last, we have the gas discharge tube, also known as a GDT. Gas discharge tubes use a sealed tube with two electrodes and an inert gas trapped inside. These components can typically conduct more current than other surge components. Like MOVs, they will also degrade over time in service and will create a short to ground while in conduction mode. These also react much slower compared to other surge technologies. GDTs are typically used in conjunction with other surge protection technologies within a hybrid protection circuit to take the leading edge or large energy hit. The most common use for this type of component is telecommunications equipment. Now let's take a look at some of the various low voltage and electrical systems located within the facility. As we proceed through the applications, we're going to show a diagram of a typical system layout, which will serve as a guide to help design the most effective surge protection solution. Here we have an application drawing of a typical network-based video surveillance system. Over the past few years, we've seen tremendous growth in the demand for surge protection on IP cameras. Considering the cost and the critical nature of network infrastructure, it is crucial to make sure any network paths that are vulnerable to carrying transients into the system are properly protected. There are two different surge protection design scenarios when working with a network-based video surveillance system. Either the cameras will be powered via PoE, which is power over Ethernet, or they will be powered from a separate transformer. In either case, there are copper wires that need to be protected. When specifying surge protection on this type of system, you would start with the network switches at the head end and specify surge protection on any network cables that leave the building or longer cabling runs that may be exposed to internally generated transients. Depending on how many network cables need protection, 
you may opt for a 12 channel rack mount solution instead of single channel surge protectors. Next, you would identify any cameras that are located outside of the facility, such as cameras mounted on a pole or an outbuilding. A single channel surge protector should be specified at the camera end as well for this scenario. The reason being this, if a transient voltage is induced onto the buried copper cabling, it can travel in both directions seeking a path to ground. So if there is a surge protector at the head end only, you risk losing the camera. The DITEC network surge protectors are all rated to pass gigabit ethernet, so there will not be any loss in the quality of the video. The PoE products will also support high wattage PoE applications up to 100 watts. Now we'll take a look at a typical analog video surveillance system. The design approach would be the same as it is with the network based systems. However, the circuits to be protected are different. With analog systems, there will be the coaxial or twisted pair of video cabling, low voltage power cabling, and RS-45 data wiring if the camera happens to be pan tilt zoom. Depending on whether the camera is fixed or PTZ, there is a specific DITEC surge protector to cover each scenario. These devices also support the high definition CCTV standards, including HD CVI, HD TVI, and analog HD. We also make a device to eliminate video noise due to a ground loop. That would be the DTK GLI pictured at the bottom of the application drawing. Network surge protection basics. This diagram is meant to illustrate the different devices that may be located outside of the building that are physically interconnected with internal systems on the same network infrastructure. Examples include IP cameras, access control card swipes and keypads, PA speakers, and wireless access points. Some key points to note are as follows. To keep surges from entering your building and your network, you must provide a layer of protection. This head-end protection point is the only way to reduce the risk associated with metallic conductors connecting external devices to internal network components. Failure to install surge protected devices places all internal network connected equipment at risk. It is also recommended to shield each externally mounted device from surges that are introduced on the same metallic conductors. Now in this illustration, we, again, we show a typical network setup, only this time we've added surge protection to the mix. So what you'll notice is we've installed products not only at the head end to protect all of the external feeds from the devices before they hit the switches, but we've also installed single channel surge protectors at each device to protect them against surges traveling along the cable towards the device end. Now here's one of our newest networking surge protection products, and this is our category 6A series. These are 10 gigabit ethernet compatible surge protectors that are third party certified to category 6A standards. They incorporate 110 punch down in and out, and they also feature internal CAT 6A cable shield terminations to allow continuity through the surge protection device. And they are also UL497B listed. We also offer an alternative variation to the CAT 6A product by the way of offering a different termination method where we have 110 punch down in and RJ45 out. This device is also 10 gigabit ethernet compatible and third party certified to the same category 6A cabling standards. Fire alarm system surge protection. This application drawing shows a typical fire alarm control system and highlights the different circuits that need to be protected. First, there is the 120 volt AC power feed, then the communication circuits, which can be either telephone, network-based, or wireless via cellular communicator. Lastly, we have the low voltage system circuits, which include SLC, NAC, IDC, and PIV. In order to properly design a surge protection system for a fire alarm application, all circuits that enter the panel from outside of the building should have a surge protector specified to mitigate the damage of a surge or spike entering through one of those paths. We'll discuss the different surge protection solutions for each circuit next. Now we'll take a look at code references regarding surge protection in a fire alarm system. And quite often we receive inquiries regarding where to find 
the specific requirements for surge within the National Electric Code or NFPA 72. Here is the Chapter 12 Circuits and Pathways excerpt in NFPA 72 2013 edition. And the section is 12.2.4.2 and states that all non-power limited and power limited signaling system circuits entering a building shall be provided with transient protection. Also in NFPA 70, which is National Electric Code in 2014 edition, Article 760.32 is non-power limited fire alarm circuits and power limited fire alarm circuits that extend beyond one building and run outdoors shall meet the installation requirements of parts two, three, and four of Article 800 and shall meet the installation requirements of part one of Article 300. A very useful informational note in NFPA 70 is that an example of a protective device suitable to provide protection is a device tested to the requirements of ANSI UL 497B, protectors for data communications. Here's an application drawing of a typical access control system. And the proper way to approach a surge protection design for access control is to start at the access control panel and identify any circuits that are coming into that panel from outside the facility. This can include the wires from the electric strike or the mag lock, 120 volt power, as well as the Wiegen feeds from your keypads or your card readers. If you have a pedestal mount keypad or card reader that's located away from the building, you would also want to install the surge protector at that point as well, in addition to protecting the wires back at the access control panel. Gate access tends to be one of the more susceptible systems when it comes to surge damage. This is mainly due to the fact that this equipment is located outdoors and incorporates a lot of copper cabling buried in the ground. In most cases, you would have a telephone entry panel, a pedestal mount keypad, or an RF receiver. Also, the gate motor running on AC power would be vulnerable to surge damage as well. This application diagram shows the various DITEC devices that can be specified to protect the copper paths leading into the sensitive equipment. Intrusion surge protection. So commercial intrusion detection works similarly to fire alarm systems in the way of surge protection design. You have 120 volt power that's feeding the burglar alarm panel, as well as a communication circuit that can be telephone lines, network based, or wireless. And then you have your signaling loops and your remote zones that would be protected in the same way the fire alarm panels are with a product like the 2MHLP series. DITEC does manufacture a complete line of AC power surge protectors for electrical panels. The Zeus series product is available in surge current ratings from 50,000 amps per phase up to 200,000 amps per phase, and they are all UL listed under 1449 fourth edition as type one SPDs. All products are available in every voltage configuration up to 600 volt three phase delta, and the D200 model incorporates, in addition to diagnostic LEDs, an audible alarm, as well as a dry contact circuit for remote notification. All three series of product come standard in a NEMA 4X polycarbonate, weather resistant enclosure. We've recently implemented an engineering web portal via our website by registration only that contains A&E specifications, product CAD drawings available in both PDF and DWG format, technical white papers, and design criteria. And here's our contact information. The DITEC website is www.ditechcorp.com. The DITEC sales team can be reached here at the factory by dialing 1-800-753-2345. If you prefer online chat service, that's available on our website as well. And our 24-7 tech support number is 1-888-472-6100.